we have a lot of questions I see here. We'll try to get our colleagues, we have all these papers already collected, so we'll try to get our colleagues there to sort them out. But uh, I have some very just um, uh, brief questions of further clarification which we didn't get to ask because we didn't interrupt any of the lectures. Uh, Miguel, when you said that the, the monkey was learning to move without any uh, of its own senses, but how about the sense of sight to look on the screen and decide which of the two? It was still using some of its own. No, no, no. Visual cues were identical. Uh, so the animal could not use the visual system to decide which one to choose. And even if you block uh, sight, the animal could still do uh, the task. Okay. And uh, a, uh, a further clarification, going back to the very beginning, Bruno Mezzoni, you did, uh, you mentioned cartoon studies and so on. Did you actually also do uh, focal groups on what kind of shape humans felt comfortable with, what size, what shape, and so on. You did, you tested various models before you decided on little Nao, who I think won the hearts of everybody here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at the beginning, we didn't knew at all which was the uh, right shape, or we didn't know if there were a right shape. So we just tested different shapes, we just tested different uh, possibilities, and we presented that to focus groups of customers, of uh, 10, 15 customers. First, it was our families and friends, and after that, we've been for old people and so on. And it just gave us this answer. So we didn't choose that. It was not forecasted, or it's just the conclusion, outcome of these focus groups. Very well. Uh, I, uh, I would like, as our colleagues are really sifting through these mountains of questions that I will try to uh, summarize for you, I hope that we can also uh, use uh, uh, this image that we now have uh, to broadcast it on, on Egyptian television, uh, not just on uh, the webcast that people are watching. And therefore, with your permission, I would like to ask each of you in a very few short sentences to uh, summarize uh, the key points of your presentation. Uh, and uh, we uh, will start in the same sequence that we did. So uh, uh, we want to say that Bruno, you created a, a robot that uh, mm -hmm. is now being sold to people. And it's a little robot that has a limited number of applications right now, but can accept more. The, the, the robot we developed is a humanoid robot of 60 centimeters tall. And uh, it's a programmable robot. It's a platform with which everybody, every labs, research labs, or, or students, education, can experiment. So you can program the robot to do whatever you want and explore interaction with people, explore uh, uh, useful robots, edutainment robots, these kind of things. And the, the programming is an open source system? Programming is open, it's not open source system, it's a proprietary code, but everything is open architecture. That means you can change whatever part you want, you can exchange with other labs, you can exchange with other students. The IT in the audience, you've heard that, I think that's important. Thank you very much. Professor Dario, you've been uh, learning from the best that animals can do and how we can get it back to, to uh, deal with human medical problems and back and forth. Yeah, um, you know, my interest has always been in, uh, uh, from an engineering point of view, try to find uh, different solutions and nature offers this kind of uh, Heat is really a tremendous uh, uh, kind of lessons that we can learn. Of course, from humans uh, to you know virtually any kind of uh, animal or biological species, including plants, actually, which are a tremendous model for uh, behavior. For example, how they can uh, take uh, uh, you know energy from uh, from the soil. We are developing plantoid robots. So, and uh, mixing science uh, with engineering. Plantoid robots with mixed science and engineering. But, uh, Professor uh, Ishiguro, you, you really are the world's pioneer in creating not just androids, but geminoids, which are perfect replicas of yourself or someone else, or we can each hope to have our own geminoid in the future? Or? 
Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, um, the, now we are using a cell phone. Cell phone can the, uh, bridge the people the anywhere and anytime. And what the, if we consider the uh, next media after the uh, cell phone, I think, uh, you know, that we need to develop uh, uh, new types of media that can transmit our presence to the distant place. So I think that is the future of a robot. And, and well, you know, um, it depends. Well, I, I, I will not say, you know, everybody is going to have their own copy. But, uh, you know, the, we, we can find some uh, intermediate design the, uh, uh, which can be accepted by everybody. So anyway, you know, the uh, teleoperated robot or teleoperated, teleoperated the uh, presence will be, uh, you know, the next important media. That is my feeling. Well, I can imagine sort of having copies of myself and putting them in different <laughs> parts of the library so that my staff will always be wondering whether it's the real me or someone <laughs> else. <laughs> They'll be on their, on their toes. Uh, Miguel, you've been uh, reading the, the actual brain waves and sending them to a different machine rather than having, uh, having the, the uh, individual controlled machine. So, uh, you're hoping with that to help? Yeah, we, we are using what we call brain-machine interfaces first to understand the principles of how populations, large populations of brain cells operate, physiological principles. And the second uh, uh, goal of these studies is to see what is the limit of uh, the, in, the types of interfaces that you can establish between living brain tissue and machines hoping that one day we can develop prosthetic devices to help uh, people with neurological disorders to regain uh, mobility among other neurological functions. But as Kevin was saying, there will be a, a possibility for using the same ideas uh, for normal people in the future, I think. So you can be sitting in a place and enjoying uh, a different place completely uh, foreign to you just by using your brain to control uh, some device uh, that is located remotely. So an instant vacation, I just sit here, turn on. Yes, and, and you're in I'm Brazil. I'm sitting on the beach in Brazil, yes. and, uh, and back again whenever, so 10 minutes later, I'm now yeah. back, I've had an instant vacation in Brazil, maybe. Your, your brain could have whatever body you want to have, yeah. Well, that's, now that's opening a lot of possibilities. That Kevin, you've uh, carried it further than any uh, human on Earth. And uh, uh, would you just say a few words about uh, summarizing for the TV yeah. audience, now, not just for the robots? Well, uh, three messages. One was that robots can have biological brains. Now, that means that in the future they can have human brains that are grown for the robot, maybe with the number of brain cells greater than your brain. So is the robot then under your control, can you switch it off? Do you have a right to switch it off if it has more human brain cells than you have? Or will it try and switch you off, is point one. Um, point two, we can use artificial intelligence to help people with disabilities. It's an enormous area. Anybody who's interested in biomedicine, this is a very, very exciting area. We can understand diseases like Parkinson's disease, like epilepsy, other, many other diseases, and potentially counteract their effects using artificial intelligence. It's using AI to understand the human brain. But the biggest thing of all, I think, and I'm pleased to see that in BioVision 2011, it's part of the program, human enhancement. You don't have to be restricted in the future by the poor shape that you're in as a human. You can enhance, you can upgrade, you can have new senses, you can have extra memory, you can be all over the world, as, as we've seen, as we've heard. Most of all, I think, you will be able to communicate in a whole new way as an enhanced human, directly from brain to brain very, very exciting future, as long as you're happy to upgrade. Well, that, that uh, raises a question uh, from a person who obviously uh, we would have liked to have here with us uh, because he's been sort of uh, also a, a big uh, prophet of this kind of a future. And I'm thinking of uh, Ray Kurzweil. 
And Ray uh, Kurzweil has said that, uh, in fact, uh, we uh, human beings have uh, wonderful software, our brain, but in very poor hardware, our bodies. And so that in the future, we'll kind of download our brains uh, onto some sort of machines. And then whenever a part wears out, we just replace that part. And when new parts are better designed, come online, we just replace the old parts with new parts. It's like perpetual use, but in a different way. Uh, do you think that is a future? Yeah, Ray's completely right. Um, I think with some body parts, it doesn't mean to say they will be direct replacements. As we've seen with Oscar Pistorius, the, he's the, the sprinter who has carbon fiber legs that allow him to spring, and he's been challenging the Olympic authorities. He wants to take part in the Olympics with these artificial legs. I, I mean, I, I say, why not? Uh, it, it challenges ethical thinking in society as well. I think at the present time, we can replace different body parts, but some of the organs, some of the lungs and uh, the, the kidneys even perhaps, we still have problems with if we were looking for a replacement. But that's just at this moment. If we're looking 10 or 20 years ahead, then yes, let, let's go forward into a, a silicon future and replace your body parts. Why, when you're old, why have back pain? when you can replace it with a robotic back? Why have legs that won't move when you can replace them by robotic body parts? I think it's very exciting, yeah. Well, Miguel, do you think we'd still be human then? <laughs> That's a real well, question. My, my point of view is that we always be human. Uh, machines will be assimilated by us, not the opposite. Not the opposite. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no machine will ever be human because, as I said, in my opinion, they may be conscious in a different way, they may, may feel in a different way, you may even build an artificial brain that behaves in a particular way that is close to human. But to be human is to have, as Stephen Jay Gould said, this unwinding history that if you rewind the tape and play back again, we may not be here. We could not have been here because evolution could have taken a completely different uh, way. So our brains, uh, they are the result of that evolutionary process and you cannot mimic that experiment. You cannot repeat that experiment in a laboratory. So we cannot reproduce that part of humanity in a machine. But I think the opposite will happen. But, if, but if you grow a biological brain on a machine, yeah, if you grow a, that biological brain that is now grown on a machine as opposed yeah, to downloading... That brain we will never be able to be exposed to the same evolutionary pressures that we had in our history. These are millions of years of evolution that will never happen again. There is no way to reproduce the sequence of events that led to the particular brain that we have. So it's kind of the epigenetic side of it. Uh, yeah, well, it, this, is, this is, of course, is a matter of uh, big debate, but uh, yeah. w you really simply cannot reproduce their history. Yeah. Do you think we can? If every, everybody agreed, it, was, it would not be a, de a debate. Yeah, no, so, no, no, <laughs> so personally, I think, I, I, I think uh, we could extend our possibility controlling uh, other tools, objects, robots, sure. whatever, with our brain, sure. sure. But in my opinion, uh, what makes us human is based on our history of interaction with other people, of, course, of interaction yeah. with, with our possibilities. That means going, awesome. going forward to what you, sorry, to what you said, uh, uh, Kevin, uh, I, I think would change the nature of human being. So the question is, I don't, I don't say it's not going to happen, I don't know, but I'm saying no. we would not be the, the same. same. But, well, that's, uh, evolution. We would no more be human. But what I was saying is our personal lives, of course, our personal history is part of this evolutionary history that I'm talking about, of course. So that's, those are two histories, yeah. evolution and personal, that you cannot reproduce in a dish. There's but, no way. But I, I think evolution moves forward. Evolution doesn't, da -da 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 -da, here's humanity, okay, now I'll put my feet up and relax. Evolution doesn't do that. Evolution keeps moving Same. ahead. So we're going to change anyway, and we will change from being the humans we are now. But I, I think we are faced now with the possibility of technology enhancing that even, like Ray Kurzweil was saying, technology enhancing and pushing forward the speed of that evolutionary change. We can actually 
define by turning a dial yeah. some of the ways in which we can evolve. But, but I have a question that fits into this particular part of the debate right now, and this is whether uh, anybody here, Professor, are you, any, any of the participants would like to answer the question, can future robots generate new ideas that are not initially programmed uh, by the experimenters? In other words, uh, if you take uh, uh, John Cozaz's evolutionary programs, three or four steps further, does one generate uh, uh, the computer software that ultimately the machines would be able to evolve their own programs? And if so, would they have feelings? Would they have consciousness? Well, as far as I can see, I, I, I don't see reasons why this should not happen in the remote future, however, I would say. Um, uh, I, I personally think, and I'm very much interested at this time, in uh, the human part of the story, I would say, because uh, I've been designing robots for, for decades, uh, and now I think that what really fascinates me more is uh, uh, what, what happens from a design point of view, from the human point of view. I think robotics is an extraordinary way of uh, improving, of challenging our brain, <laughs> not only the brain of the robot. You know, there was a discussion for years. We actually, 10 years ago, started the, the area that is now quite uh, popular of robo-ethics. Okay? Yeah, robo -ethics. So wh what is ethics? Uh, what are principles for robots? And after a few years of discussion, we came to the conclusion that uh, the ethics uh, for robots uh, is, is, is not really an issue now. What is an issue? Is the ethics for the manufacturers of robots, for the constructor of robots, which is back to the story I was saying. So how much it, robotics challenges us as, as scientists, as engineers, as, as humans, as students. Hiroshi, if I may yeah. ask you, you've yeah. been saying that right. you know, well, it's part the, of being human to reflect on being human. So yeah, well, uh, you know, the, the first of all, the, I want to say, the, uh, you know, the, still we are looking for the definition of a human. You know, the, um, the, it's quite difficult to define the hu what is a human, and always we are changing the definitions. You know, maybe the 100 years ago, if you know, if we don't have our legs and arms, you know, probably we, the, our society, they couldn't accept that kind of people as a human. But you know, of course, today we are accepting. So we are always looking for the definition of a human. So that is the, uh, well, you know, the most fundamental issue for science and, 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 and for the new things. You know. And if we follow the biological principle, I think uh, you know, robots can find the, uh, some new ideas. And, you know, the, we, we can simulate the, uh, some uh, process of evolution. So uh, well, I, I didn't have enough time to talk about the uh, uh, biological fluctuations, but you know, I think uh, you know, that kind of a study is quite important, and biologists are quite interested in uh, biological and the, the effect of a biological, fluctua uh, biological uh, fluctuations. And you know, now we, you know, they, we try to um, they develop the, uh, some uh, you know, the uh, computer uh, the, uh, system for uh, mimicking the uh, biological fluctuation. And, and, and the feeling, feeling is a little bit different. So mechanically, I think it's easy to imitate the human-like feeling, but you know, the uh, feeling or the consciousness and the intelligence, this is the uh, sub uh, you know, subjective phenomena. So we need to define these things the best on the uh, society, right? And, and if we focus on the just one the entity, like, uh, you know, just one body, just one robot, I think, um, well, you know, the, we cannot define the feeling or the consciousness and the uh, or intelligence. You know, the, well, for example, the I'm, you know, I, I, well, I, I'm not so good for uh, the, uh, having the smiling face, you know, but I'm not angry. Right? So that is, you know, some, yeah, well, you know, subconscious, uh, the, well, and subjective, right? So that is my, well, the feeling. Right? Well, thank you. Let me go back then on this side because uh, this is a recurrent question I have four or five times. Uh, can you see robots? taking control of humans. Of course, that is 
a theme that was in the Terminator, that was a theme that's in many uh, movies and uh, doomsday scenarios and so on. Uh, and since so many people from the audience really want to. <laughs> well, I, I can, I'll pass that one because I'm a scientist and I don't work on the movie industry, so I don't have much experience. And I did think the surrogates was a bad movie. Yeah, it was bad. <laughs> okay. Avatar was better. <laughs> but I think we should be careful about mixing science and fiction in Hollywood. I think these things don't mix very well. Yeah, I, let me challenge you on that because after all, uh, fiction. science fiction sure. is where a lot of things were imagined once and then got no, realized no, no. later science on. Science fiction, uh, you mentioned two great guys, Asimov. Yes, Asimov, Asimov was and, phenomenal uh, because he was Jules both. Verne and yeah, Julio Verne. Yeah, Julio Verne. There's another guy that do, both are very good in both sides, but it's it's not easy to find. You know, not all of them. Uh, yeah, still, yeah. I, I have to disagree, Miguel, with what you're saying about yourself, because I okay. think yourself. Yes, um, you're saying you're not interested in science fiction <laughs> as a scientist. No, no. I, I, I was a scientist. We are directly interested in science fiction. That's how science works. We make a hypothesis. We say, I believe this is possible. I believe this can happen. I believe this is what happens here. We then go and prove scientifically this is the case, or maybe we don't get it right. That is science fiction. Yeah. No, no, we make the hypothesis. Now, the leap usually is based, as Isaac Newton said, standing on the shoulders of giants. So we're already, sure. so far, we, now a science fiction writer will usually maybe step yeah. some years ahead. But very often, with Jules Verne, with, with Carol Chapek, the, uh, with uh, Michael know. Crichton, these are science fiction writers that are making a hypothesis. Very often, some or all of it is then proved yeah. this is the case as far as people then bring it about. Well, so, well, let me just try to defend myself a little bit here. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm the son of a writer, uh, you know, and I, I'm, I just finished my first book, so I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, I'm not saying that I, didn't, I don't like science fiction or I don't appreciate, in fact, I appreciate and, and read a lot of science fiction. What I'm saying is that when you are trying to talk about science, you need to ground your argument in, on data and concrete evidence and, and reproducible and testable hypothesis. I'm all for speculating about the future and talking, this is fun and it's all, but I think there is a danger of giving the wrong message, uh, saying that science, science scientists, professional scientists like us, are actually crossing the border and speculating beyond what our data can tell you. This is the only thing. I truly love science fiction when you put it in the right context. Yeah. yeah. I, don't know, I, I have to say I, I can see the points, but I, I, I think it's different. As a responsible scientist, I feel it is um, implicit on me to look at potential future scenarios of the work that I'm doing. I, I think if there's something can be used for good or bad or whatever, just for me to say, no, I'm not going to look into the future. No, that's all. That's 10 years away. I'm not responsible for that. I would believe that is wrong. It's, it's inherent in me to start looking at the potential outcomes of my work. And the specific question here is about robots, artificial intelligence systems taking over from humans, the dangers, the threats. And in that instance, if we have to look at artificial intelligence systems, firstly, why are humans in the power, the position, the situation that we are in on Earth. It, it's not about our physical capabilities. We've been hearing they're perhaps redundant. It's about our intelligence. We've heard the human brain, the power of the human brain. That's what we've been hearing about. The human brain as depends on how 100 billion neurons connected in a certain way that make you human. If something comes along that has 200 billion or 300 billion neurons, it is a potential threat for us to ignore it and say, no, 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 it's not human, it's not a possibility, it, it's not a threat, is wrong. And it's, so is a meteor coming and crashing. So, so or, yeah. or aliens, if, they, or if aliens weather. or whatever came down to Earth yeah. and they have intellectual mm. abilities way beyond ours, if you believe aliens are possible, 
then it's a potential threat. And if we here create robots with brains of maybe with 10 neurons or 50, it doesn't matter too much. It's nice for the lab. But if we start putting 500 billion or one gazillion brain cells into a robot and giving it particularly military style capabilities so it can defend itself, then it's dangerous. And the potential threat of, in some forms, intelligent network machines taking over, as described in the Terminator, is a danger. And if anybody who's interested in artificial intelligence robotics said, no, 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 it's not a danger, then I think they are being irresponsible. So uh, that's, thank you. We, we, we really uh, uh, need to watch for developments as they go. But let me reverse completely, uh, this is a question here, completely the reverse of uh, uh, robots taking over. Uh, there's a question, maybe Professor Dari would be the best one to start this. This is uh, uh, about uh, micro uh, robots, nanoscale robots going inside the human body and uh, helping do surgery and things of that nature and assisting uh, human beings. Yeah, this uh, is I think we're all also, again, science fiction, remember the fantastic <laughs> journey and yeah. other yeah. stories of that kind. Uh, this is exactly a case in which uh, uh, the, uh, what I call the science fiction for engineers <laughs> because yeah. it's the kind of science fiction that uh, like Asimov's story, you know, I, I, I refer many times to Asimov's uh, ideas, including this one, you know. Uh, well, obviously, if you remember some book like uh, uh, the, the, the one of, uh, of, of the trip into the, into the vein. Uh, I use this case uh, uh, with my students to, to uh, actually I taught a course on how this cannot happen because uh, of uh, 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 just the scaling laws. You, know, you, you cannot scale down a submarine. Uh, of course, you cannot scale down humans, not at this time. But certainly you can scale down uh, using a different principle, many of them taken from uh, the biological world. It is clear that amoeba, for example, are excellent example, or, or, or blood cells, on how they, they could navigate. So um, this is no longer science fiction, actually, because uh, if you could uh, uh, track uh, a sort of uh, history, there was a student asking to me before, uh, what about robotics in surgery? Actually, robots are used now in surgery. There are more than 1,400 uh, uh, robots used for prostate or for hysterectomy currently. So this happened in the 90s. In the 20s, the frontier has been the centimeter scale, like uh, the swallowable pills. The new frontier, that means uh, this decade, is for millimeter scale robots that can be controlled from outside or partly from inside and that can be used with micro cameras uh, and to, to, to uh, visualize uh, uh, or other, other mi micro and nano technologies and to deliver uh, therapies within the, the uh, blood vessels and not only the blood vessels. So, this is coming. Uh, well, would you, is. okay, this is another question to all of you here. Uh, we will be increasingly relying on robots to do a lot of things, but we've had some difficulty in defining death. Clinical death, when somebody is uh, legally dead, brain dead, uh, whatever. Is this something that you would entrust to robots? To answer? No. <laughs> well, wow. it goes back to the issue about uh, life, uh, of course. Uh, before, uh, what is life? Uh, yes, and, what, uh, what is humans? I can just tell you a story about uh, my Japanese colleagues, for example. A uh, few years ago, we had a discussion about uh, uh, human emotions. So we had a workshop in Japan on uh, uh, the, the Japanese and uh, European vision, uh, Western, let's say, of robotics. And, and, and the question that was asked by somebody is, how would you define uh, uh, love? And uh, so uh, a European gave a very sophisticated reply saying, uh, love uh, is the ability 
to take care of a person without, uh, in a, in a, a non-programmable way without uh, any second objective and things like that. Well, and then immediately afterwards, uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Ashimoto uh, university, was at the university said, well, this is not true. When I go to a temple and I look uh, at uh, a, a stone with uh, all uh, the inscription there, I see the stone, I love the stone, and I see that the stone loves me. So, so you think is that is the Japanese yes. the mind? Can you well, agree with right, that? Yeah, yeah, probably, you know, the Japanese will be able to... So a know, stone can live. Has a soul you know, and, everything you know, has a soul. Yeah, yeah well, it's, 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 you know, that is a kind of subjective phenomenon. It depends on the how, uh, what, what kind of things we believe, right? And it, I think, you know, the death is, well, you know, the, uh, probably we can, it, it's quite going to be difficult to define the human itself based on the death or life, right? So, you know, it, it, well, probably the, we can put the, our memory in a computer network and we can influence, you know, the other people the after, you know, death. So that, that is the uh, information technology. Well, then and then the, whole, the whole meaning of death and life will change, I suspect. Uh, I keep getting signals that we're running out of time. So I would like to give you, this is for the television audience, I would like to give you a chance to each say a, sort of the last message We'll go from here and here and here and here, and then we'll end up with Bruno and me. And I want to introduce <laughs> this little guy to the television audience who didn't necessarily see uh, the earlier webcast. So, uh, okay, last well, words for the Egyptian television audience. Uh, okay, well, beyond um, this audience here, we have an audience here, but beyond it, there's the television cameras and will carry to the right. Egyptian television audience. Um, I think uh, you know the robotics research is going to. Um, um, is changing now, and, and uh, we are uh, trying to integrate the uh, multiple uh, in, uh, the uh, disciplinaries like uh, cognitive science and neuroscience and, 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 and robotics. So that means that uh, you know, uh, um, um, probably we, we can get some new knowledge uh, by studying the uh, robots and by building a robot. So that is our future, I think. Um, we just uh, submitted uh, one hour ago a new proposal that is called Robotown. <laughs> uh, because this is my vision of robotics. Uh, 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 my vision is uh, robots, uh, meaning uh, intelligent, but not so intelligent machines. That means uh, no more intelligent than we are, uh, living with us, uh, helping us. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Who defines the average we, are you, I, I would submit that of all the species we know on Earth, there's no species that has a greater differential in intelligence than Homo sapiens. Between Einstein and some of the people I know, there's a gap of such magnitude that I sometimes wonder whether they should be in the same species. So when you say not more well, intelligent than we, and who defines what, what the we is? Because, because I think this is a challenge. This is part of a challenge. A robot should be able to understand and to adapt to the intelligence of the person he, he or she or it is interacting with. So he's going to be putting up with us the way we see it. Kevin. Yeah, we know that as well as robots understanding and adapting, they can learn and they can learn how to do things for themselves. We are going to see robots that are super intelligent in the future. Therefore, I feel it's critical for us as humans to look at enhancement. If not just to enhance ourselves, to give ourselves extra senses and communicate in new ways, but to stay ahead of intelligent robots. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the library and the uh, organizers and the Egyptian people for this reception to all of us scientists to this meeting. It has been a great honor, a great pleasure to come to this that is the, the first house of knowledge of mankind and is a great delight to be able to address everybody. I'd like to say that the future is bright. Science uh, has a great contribution for the future of our species. The understanding of the brain is one of the greatest frontiers of knowledge. And I'm delighted that, as the library has done in the past, 
the Library of Alexandria will participate in this journey into the future of understanding the principles that govern how the, brain, the human brain works and trying to use these principles to alleviate the pain and sorrow of those that cannot behave like they should with the dignity of a human being. Thank you, Leo. And now, at the ending, Bruno. Bruno, you are the creator of Now, who has been sitting on my lap here from this picture for a while now. Very lovable little guy. And we'll show the TV audience in a moment, or show him Now standing up and saying something. But anyway, any last words from you? Many thanks, uh, Professor. Uh, a few words first. Uh, I've never seen things that were accessible to humankind by science and technology that has not been put in practical. So that means all what we have said today will happen. That means we have to prepare, we have to put constraints. It's absolutely mandatory to put limits, and uh, that, uh, that has to be done. But I wanted to say we have time for that. You know, uh, if you look at a fly, look at what a fly is able to do with less brain than your toaster. So we still have, uh, we have to be humble. Even uh, microcomputer, even large computer we're having are not intelligent at all for now. Sometimes uh, journalists are asking myself, what is the intelligence of now uh, compared with uh, uh, a child of two years, three years old? Well, in my opinion, he's comparable with an ant. So that means we still have years before having uh, robots that will be uh, intelligent enough to, 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 to be uh, interlocutors at the level we are speaking about. So we have time to put limits, but it will happen. We'll have robots everywhere in our society, and thanks to the robots, we will have more autonomy when we will turn old, old persons, old people, when we will turn old, we will have more autonomy thanks to the robot we'll have at home. And now is a robot that is helping research labs to develop and to explore this new field. So I'm happy to present now here. Thank you, Bruno. And now, audience, we give, we give the very last word to the only bona fide, or we do have a cyborg, but only bona fide robot in the panel. The last word goes to now. <laughs> wow, but I need the three minutes to reboot it. <laughs> You see, those who are worried about how robots are going to take the, wor the world over, right now, little Nao needs a full 120 seconds just to boot up. So as you can see, he's not quite ready to take the world yet. <laughs> and I think it's part of the design that he shouldn't be too dangerous and that people should feel sufficiently comfortable with it uh, for them to have them at home, right? And, be, and before having, before having now or waking up, uh, it's one of the requests we've had from our societal committee. When we are developing robots inside the Lebanon Robotics, we, from the beginning, are working with philosophers, sociologists, anthropologists, uh, journalists, to help us with this ethical question, ethical concerns, because we, we want to integrate in the design from the beginning this kind of question. And for instance, what has to be done, oh, he's waking up, is, is to put a button, everybody willing to stop his robot immediately can do that uh, immediately. So these kind of things uh, are important for having people accepting the robot. I was just wondering, for the robotics thing, can you use this button in humans as well? Can you... <laughs> so, can we have a button for humans yeah. as well? I mean, as many husbands and wives might want one of these. <laughs> Famous dance. So 
he understood what I asked him to do, so he will dance for you.